period of time out there. And once I entered that next stage, it, it was like, well, eventually I will make it out of here. Steve was being carried across the Atlantic by the North Equatorial Current, and he knew from the charts in Dougal Robertson's book that he was south of this main transatlantic shipping route. So the best chance of being spotted wouldn't come till he was here, where ships passing from New York to the Cape crossed his route. But on the 14th night, he saw his first of several lone ships. Hey! It looked like it was coming to pick me up. So I kept firing up flares and swinging water and having a gay old time. But, um, the ship just kept steaming on, obviously hadn't seen me at all. I was very angry with myself because I'd counted on being rescued before the rescue was actually there. It was a good wake-up call for me, and I knew that I was probably making a lot of mistakes. And I made it a point to repeat to myself over and over again, you're only doing the best you can, that's all you can do. And that was important for me to kind of remind myself of that, forgive myself. Even after he'd established a routine, Steve could never relax. The dark shape of the raft made him a perfect target for sharks, and he often had to fend off unwanted attention with his spear gun. But there was one thing Steve feared more than shark attack, and that was damaging his raft. It was a risk he took every time he tried to catch food. On the 43rd day, I speared a fish, and the fish broke the spear, turned it around, and ran it into the bottom of the raft and ripped a fairly large hole in it. I knew I was in really big trouble then. This is how you repair a rip like that. You have to improvise some sort of bung to put in there. I've got a cork here. Of course, the gash Steve repaired was much larger than this, and he didn't have a cork. He had to improvise with bits of foam. Once you've got that in there, you need to gather the material around the bung and lash it in place with some fishing line or any sort of string that you can improvise. Got a bit of whipping twine here. And when you think that I'm doing this in ideal circumstances, Steve, well, he was tired, wet, scared, and the gash was in a really awkward place. It didn't matter how tightly I tied that lashing. Whenever I inflated the bottom tube, it, was, it would try to stretch the mouth out again, and the plug that I had inside of it would just basically fall out. My feet were kind of going like this down, down into, the, into the water, and that meant that you know, it was incredibly uncomfortable, impossible to sleep, virtually impossible to fish in those conditions. And I was dragging this big bag of water with me, so the raft all of a sudden slowed to almost a dead stop in the water. I can't tell you exactly how freaked out and depressed I was. Steve faced 10 days of the same grueling routine. Plug the hole, pump up the raft, listen for bubbles, feel it deflate, and then start all over again. I wasn't eating properly, and I wasn't getting as much water as I was before, so it was an incredibly frustrating period, and, and one in which physically I deteriorated a lot. I realized that if I didn't find a solution, that I'd probably be dead in a matter of hours, and that kind of scared me back into reality. It finally dawned on me that if I put a pin through the upper lip and the bottom lip, that I could use that and as, as a fixed point, and that, that pin could not possibly fall out no matter how much pressure was put against it, and that gave me a point against which I could, I could make a lashing. This is basically how the repair looked. What Steve did was he pinned it with a broken shaft of a fork, and behind that he lashed it securely to make it airtight. Well, with that in place, the raft was stable, and he could think about finding land. He was still in this area here, about 600 miles from the West Indies, but now pinpointing his exact position became critical.
if this is the West uh, with the United States sort of over here and the West Indies and the West Indies kind of come up and then, then bend westward and the Bahamas off of Florida and England is over here, you have a general circulation of the North Atlantic of winds and currents that go kind of like this. So I was started off in the Canary Islands drifting towards the West Indies, but I was worried if I got above 18 degrees latitude that I would actually miss the West Indies, get caught up in the Gulf Stream, and end up at best in the Bahamas another month or so later. And at worst case, get caught up in the Gulf Stream in a strong way and end up actually turning northward and eventually eastward and end up over in England, which would have taken a year and something. And uh, I, I, I would never have even made, I would never have made the Bahamas. I don't think I would have made it over to England. So to find out exactly where he was, Steve first timed a piece of seaweed to see how long it took to reach the end of a piece of rope. That gave him his rough speed, and from that he could work out how far west he had drifted. Figuring out how far north or south you are is a bit more tricky, but it's quite good fun to try yourself. What you have to do is improvise a sort of a sextant, and this is how Steve did it. He took three pencils like this and connected them together into a triangle using elastic bands. The way we use this sextant is to measure the angle between the horizon and the north star at night. We do that by sighting along first this pencil and then this one, adjusting it as we need to. The angle that we get here corresponds to our latitude. I'll explain why. If I was standing on the Earth here at the North Pole, I'd find the pole star directly above me at 90 degrees. If I was standing on the equator, I'd find it just on the horizon at zero degrees. So whatever that angle that we read here, that will correspond to our latitude. In Steve's case, he was hovering on or about the line of 17 degrees north, which would bring him into the Leeward Islands somewhere around here. Two months after sinking, Steve had easily passed Dougal Robertson's 38 days, and what he'd achieved was remarkable. He'd organized food and water, overcome shark attacks and the leak in the raft, and was able to establish where he was, having covered 1,400 miles. But you're not a survivor until you've reached land and returned to full health. And in the 75th night, I finally started seeing the loom of a lighthouse, and as soon as I saw that, I had a had a whopping party, which for me was to drink a pint of water. I was so delighted. I mean, I can't. yet I didn't want to believe that I was saved until I was actually on a beach on, you know, on solid ground. Steve was finally rescued by local fishermen the next morning. He'd lost a third of his body weight, but at least he was still alive. Steve's survival owes much to knowing what to do. His raft and emergency bag were well stocked, he did all the right things as the abandoned ship, and he was able to improvise whenever things started to go wrong. But he also had determination and a positive mental attitude. I came away with a feeling that you, you can't, you really can't control your destiny, but you can at least try to affect it. And if you're in an unpleasant situation, you can just do the best you can in order to affect a, a, a positive outcome. If that doesn't work, try it again. And if you're lucky enough, then you'll get through the situation. Next week, in the footsteps of Geronimo across the Arizona desert.